Humans have been marking the passage of time since the earliest days of the hunter-gatherer tribes. 35,000 years ago, a tribe that inhabited the land between modern-day Swaziland and South Africa tracked and predicted the cycles of the moon. This is evidenced by the discovery of the Lambobo bone, a baboo's fibula carved with notches believed to signify the passage of the moon. A more definite attribution to lunar observation has been determined by the discovery of the moon phase bone. Found in the Cro-Magnon caves of France and dated to around 33,000 BC, the bone carving accurately depicts the moon's phases. As it tracks the period of a month, it was likely to be of some ceremonial significance, suggesting that the tribe had members dedicated to the study of the heavens. Knowing the exact period within any lunar month and being able to predict a specific point in the future and also being portable allows us to argue that these Paleolithic devices could be considered as early watches. But to more accurately determine a specific point within a whole day, observation of the sun is essential. Humans have long been marking the passage of a day using shadows cast by the sun. In early Babylon, huge obelisks were constructed in towns to allow the citizens to know the point of midday. This allowed them to split their days into the known segments of morning and afternoon. The earliest definitively identified sundial comes from Egypt, from the reign of King Tutmosis III, from about 1500 BC, although it is universally acknowledged that sundials have been independently invented by every civilization on Earth, from the Aboriginal tribes of Australia to the First Nation peoples of the Americas. If nothing else, it proves the human obsession with time. The sundial remained the dominant timepiece for millennia and are still used today, although more as a novelty in a garden or as an architectural curiosity. To be truly useful, a device that could be accurately referenced at any time of the day or night, rain or shine, summer or winter, was needed. So emerged the clepsydra literally translating as water thief. It was invented in Babylon around 1600 BC, although there is some suggestion that such devices were in use in China as early as 4000 BC, there is little in the way of supporting evidence. But the clepsydra measured the passage of time by the movement of water, or in some later Chinese examples, the movement of mercury. These clocks were used primarily in churches and temples. They allowed the adherents to know exactly when they were required to assemble for prayers and other votive activities. It was also during this period that the Babylonians developed a modern sexagesimal system of delineating time, with 60 seconds to a minute and 60 minutes to an hour. Sundials were also being used in Europe, and like the clocks in the East, were mainly for religious use. Even today, many old churches still have their mass clocks above the porch that allowed the congregation to know exactly when to congregate. After the sun had set, a far simpler method of timekeeping was being used. A burning candle marked along its length gave a more or less accurate idea of how much time had passed indoors or during the hours of darkness it was even possible to be reminded of the time with early alarm systems. A candle could be stuck with nails. When the wax securing the nail melted, it would drop to the base of the candlestick, thus marking a predetermined period of time. For wealthier citizens, sand timers were used. These were a simple sealed symmetrical glass vessel filled with a measured amount of sand. The size of the vessel and the courses of the sand determined how long it would take the sand to run from the upper to the lower level, and adjusting these factors meant that anything from a few minutes to several hours could be marked. So common did the hourglass become in Europe that it found an iconic place as a representation for the passage of time. On gravestones across Europe from the 16th to the 19th centuries, it was common to see depictions of an hourglass, often with wings, and the Latin legend Tempus Fugit, reminding the living that time flies. But the problem with these earlier timekeeping devices was that if they weren't regularly attended to, they would soon stop functioning, within a few hours at most. What was needed was something that could tell the time but didn't need that constant attention. The answer came from 14th century England. Regarded by many as the world's first purely mechanical clock, 
The clock within Salisbury Cathedral in Wiltshire, England was constructed sometime before 1386. It's still marking the hours today, nearly 650 years after it was built. It still has more than 90% of its original parts and is a perfect example of what determines the difference between a clock and a watch. The word clock comes from the German Glock, meaning bell. If a timepiece strikes a bell at specific intervals, it's a clock. If it just tells the time, it's a watch. Today, the term watch is used almost exclusively to describe a personal timepiece, whilst the clock is seen as a more static and permanent device, but that wasn't always the case. When the virgin foliate mechanism, common in the large clocks prior to the 15th century, was replaced with the tension spring, it allowed for miniaturization, and miniaturization meant portability. In 1505, the German locksmith Peter Heinlein started to build his Pomander watches. These were difficult to make and extremely expensive, making them a possession only of the wealthy. Such a novel and expensive item would attract the admiration and envy of all who saw it. However, as the name Pomanda suggests, they were not designed to be worn on the wrist, but instead hung on an expensive chain around the neck or as pendants attached to the clothing. One of the earliest references to something approaching a modern wristwatch was from 16th century England. Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, was a favourite of Queen Elizabeth I. Courtiers to the Queen would often try and gain the favour of the monarch by presenting them with expensive and exotic gifts. So it was that in 1571, Robert Dudley presented Her Majesty the Queen with an arm watch. The ability of these early watches to keep accurate time was poor at best, to the extent that until the late 17th century, watches possessed only one hand to mark the approximate passage of the hours. Their real value lay in the precious metals and jewels that were used to make them. They were engineering marvels of the day, but people were far more likely to be impressed with them as a piece of jewellery than they would be to see them as a wonder of the clockmaker's art. By the 17th century, with the invention of the spring escapement, the clockwork mechanism had become far better at keeping time, and the fob, or pocket watch, was becoming common. There are second-hand accounts of the great French polymath and inventor of the mechanical calculator, Blaise Pascal, wearing a watch attached to the wrist via a strap, though these accounts cannot be truly corroborated. By the 18th century, Pocket watches were ubiquitous amongst men, with even persons of modest means seldom being seen without them. But such watches were still confined exclusively to the pocket, and almost exclusively to men. But it wouldn't be until the early 19th century that the clock we recognise as the wristwatch would make its lasting appearance. When the Duke of Luchtenbergen, the stepson to Napoleon I, Eugène de Beauharnais, married Princess Auguste Amélie of Lichtenbergen in 1809, the Empress Josephine presented her daughter-in-law with two bracelets, one containing a watch, the other a calendar. These were made in 1806 by the Parisian jeweller Nito. As with most fashions, people saw these novelties and wanted them for themselves, so by the 1840s, the watch bracelet was popular. By the 1850s, the ability to tell the time accurately had become of great importance, mainly due to the railway network that had spread across Europe. Catching a train was an everyday activity for rich and poor alike, and as they ran to a strict timetable, people required a watch that kept good time. Many watchmakers were producing watch bracelets, but these were elaborate pieces with jeweling of sapphires, rubies, and even diamonds. These early bracelet watches were dainty and pretty, and worn exclusively by ladies. Gentlemen considered the wristwatch to be too small to be properly engineered in order to keep accurate time, and too easily damaged by shock or contamination with dust and moisture due to their being exposed upon the wrist. But perhaps most disagreeable to any gentleman was that they were considered effeminate. Wristwatches were worn only by ladies. 
As in previous centuries, a gentleman who wanted to keep track of time carried a pocket watch, usually tucked into the pocket of a waistcoat and attached to an Albert chain, a chain introduced by Prince Albert, the consort of Queen Victoria, which had a clip at one end to attach to the pocket watch and a bar at the other to fasten it to a buttonhole to prevent the watch from being dropped. This was a long-standing fashion of how a true gentleman dressed to present himself to the world. It was not fashion but war that changed people's attitudes towards them. During the Third Anglo-Burmese War of 1885, that officers from the British cavalry developed wrist pockets, a simple strap of leather with an open-faced pocket at the front that allowed them to carry a pocket watch on the wrist. This enabled them to quickly check their watches whilst on horseback without having to fumble about for a pocket watch, but it also allowed it to be returned to the pocket for everyday use. These wrist pockets were not commercially available, so it's likely the officers simply commissioned their saddlers to make them individually upon request. The act of placing a pocket watch on the wrist was also utilised during the Boer Wars of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. No doubt due to the men returning, still wearing the watches in this fashion, the wrist watch was becoming relatively common amongst civilian gentlemen in Europe. But even the most renowned watchmakers of the day were finding it impossible to gain any great interest from gentlemen in the United States. As late as 1916, a year before the United States joined its British, French and Russian allies on the battlefields of Europe, they were still seen as an object of ridicule. As late as July 1916, the New York Times printed an article questioning the trend, remarking that, until recently, the bracelet has been looked upon by Americans as more or less of a joke. Vaudeville artists and moving picture actors have utilized it as a fun maker, as a silly ass fad. In the squalid trenches of France, the newly implemented system of wireless radio could be used to coordinate large numbers of troops over very wide areas, but when radio silence was required, accurate timing of manoeuvres was essential. Watchmakers such as Omega and Longinus realised that a pocket watch was inefficient under these conditions, so produced the wristlet an adapted pocket watch with wire lugs at the sides and a strap that could be easily attached to the wrist. Being smaller than a pocket watch, they were unobtrusive, but could be easily referred to when required. The addition of radium-painted hands and numerals which glowed in the dark meant that they could be read at a glance even on the darkest nights. These wristlets quickly became an essential addition to any soldier's kit. Even as early as 1916, the British officer, Captain B.C. Lake, wrote in his Knowledge for War, Every Officer's Handbook for the Front, a list of officers' kit. The first item on the list, ahead of indispensable items such as the revolver and field glasses, is a luminous wristwatch with unbreakable glass. The importance of watches during the Great War was further emphasised by an extract from a 1916 British War Office document entitled Instructions for the Training of Divisions for Offensive Action. In that article it stated, A delay of even 30 seconds in starting must be avoided, therefore watches must be synchronised. A later section of the same document gives the instruction all officers must acquire the habit of checking their watches daily with the official time, which can be obtained from the signal service. Commanders must pay special attention to this point during training. With their use amongst the troops becoming common, later trench wristlets incorporated a protective door to the front which protected the hands and dial beneath. This harked back to the days of the Hunter Pocket Watch, which had been developed over 200 years earlier and specifically designed for a gentleman horseback engaged in hunting and other active pursuits. The cover to the front of the watch preventing any damage. When war ended in 1918, the American troops were repatriated back to the States, and they took their wristlets with them. Having been indispensable in battle, they were no longer regarded as a feminine fashion accessory, but quickly became the must-have accessory for every man. Watchmakers were keen to monopolize on the new trend and were quick to flood the market with a new wristlet. By the 1930s, sales of the wristwatch had far exceeded sales of the pocket watch, and today almost everyone wears one and probably owns several. Whether that be a cheap and simple battery-operated timepiece or a highly expensive, exquisitely engineered fashion statement, 
whether it's uh, digital or traditional, or even the latest smartwatch from which a person can connect to the world, it is another of our everyday items that emerged through the pain of progress.